Thanks, Andy. And um, I'm not sure I realized I had the last slot when I agreed to do this talk, but presumably that means that Andy's hoping me to, that I will um, bring everything together, not repeat anything too much, and kind of provide some kind of climactic experience and finish in time for everyone to have a cup of tea before they go home. So we'll see how we get on. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so, um, oh, yeah. Um, so um, I've been asked to speak um, primarily about a project that I was involved with in Bristol um, going back nearly 20 years. But actually what I think I really want to talk about is about creativity, connection and empowerment through community-led housing. So really like some of the real personal and communal gains that we get through doing this form of development. Um, and I'm here because this, I was there um, nearly 20 years ago building my own house, literally from scratch. Um, and my partner and I were very lucky to be involved very early on in a, um, a collective self-build scheme in Bristol. And the local community had seen this site come up for sale. It's a, a one hectare brownfield site and developers wanted to, to put you know, conventional kind of housing on it. Um, and the people in the local area turned around and said, we don't want that. We want something better for our community and we're gonna do it ourselves. So together, a bunch of the local <coughs> residents basically sat down and figure out how we're going to do this. And this time, no one, had, no one really knew about this term community land trusts. We kind of just made it up as we went along. Um, and that's more or less what it looks like today. Uh, we've got um, 41 homes, various sizes, from, from um, individual detached homes through to uh, apartments. Um, and most of the homes were completely self-built and some of them were self-finished. And I'll come back to talk about self-finish a bit later on. But basically, this is a very hands-on project. Um, and what that meant was not only... Each person bought their own plot and each person was notionally responsible for their own build. However, there was a lot of collaboration because, of course, when you're building alongside your neighbours like this, and actually we were meeting kind of one or two times a week um, to plan the project and agree on lots of collective things, um, you naturally want to help each other out. So when a big job came along, like pouring the foundations, everyone would come out and, and muck in. And when the job was finished, the person whose house it was would um, buy a load of donuts and coffee and everyone would have a nice celebration. So this kind of spirit here really um, created something that was way more than the sum of its parts. Um, and we've won awards, we won Good Great Neighbourhood of the Year from the Academy of Urbanism a couple of years back, really acknowledging the kind of the wider, the, the benefit this scheme had not only to the individual people living in those homes, not only to the collective of people that build together, but to the wider neighbourhood, because we really improved the whole neighbourhood and people felt that they could be involved and felt they had a voice. The one thing that I think this scheme failed to do um, it was to provide long-term affordable housing. And so a few people have spoken about this, and obviously you've got community land trusts and these models where you're protecting the value so that local people can stay in the area. We failed to do this, and there, there were reasons for that, and housing associations going bust and things. So all of those houses are now owned effectively freehold. And so what we didn't anticipate is when we built a house for 100,000, we didn't anticipate that in 10 years' time it would have a value of 400 or more. So, um, while that might have been great for some people, actually, my partner and I really wanted to um, follow this up and say, can we create something different that really creates that longer-term value for the local community and, and, and for the residents? Um, so what we've done, we've gone on to do various things, one of which was setting up our um, social enterprise, Ecomotive. And through that, we've travelled um, to gather inspiration, actually, from many parts of the world. And I wanted to give you a really, really brief flavour for some of the things that are happening elsewhere in the world and some kind of just different, different forms of development um, and way, ways that this kind of collective, affordable housing through initiative, self-initiative and self-build can come about. Um, so here's a, a place we visited in um, California, just on San Francisco Bay, and it's, it's actually floating homes. This is something a bit different. And this is a community that effectively evolved organically. So there was no planning permission. It was kind of some abandoned um, barges and boats that were, were kind of um, renovated over the years. But, I mean, they look amazing. And the community that we encountered there was, was super friendly and vibrant. Um, this, um, in other parts of the world, people are... Uh, trying to find solutions to really extreme levels of housing crisis. This is Portland, Oregon. 
uh, where lots of tech industries are moving in and um, lots of young people particularly are getting priced out, as you have here. And um, here people are being creative, for example, by collectively buying a home and then building tiny homes in the back garden and forming a little community project there. Um, and this was actually even more incredible. This is a, a, a tiny house project that was created by homeless people themselves, completely by their own initiative. They'd basically been abandoned and they went to the council and they said, we're, we're not moving until you actually give us a site. And the council gave them a dump of a site near the airport. They collaborated, they had a bit of help from local charities and they built their own homes. And they now manage this scheme. They set up their own non-profit company and they manage the scheme and they, they manage who gets to live there and um, curfews and all sorts of things. And it's, it's an incredible scheme. Um, this is a, a scheme we visited in Australia where a collective of people had bought um, a single home together on a, what they have there, the quarter acre, acre block. I don't know how many homes have that kind of size of garden here, but basically divided that rather large house into four apartments and then co-managed the back garden as a community project and invited people in to, to volunteer and look after the goats and chickens. And, and then going up to larger scale, and um, we visited... Um, really some quite large projects, um, including this scheme in, in Zurich, in Switzerland. So in other parts of Germany particularly, there are some very large housing co-ops. Um, this one has 250 residents. And again, all of these homes are at um, 80 to 90% below, uh, of market value and some significantly less. Um, and this one similar um, in Vancouver. And really beautiful projects that we can be created in, in very high density urban areas. And this one here is, is really phenomenal. This is another step up, is where, where actually the city council taking a master planning lead on, on a whole regeneration scheme and allocating, you can see different colors uh, of, of the labels there. Each of those colors denotes a plot that's being sold to a particular type of group. So for example, the yellow ones are being sold only to housing cooperatives. So this is leveling the playing field um, and another colour was only built to private self-build or co-housing groups. Levelling the playing field so these groups don't have to compete with the developers. Um, now, we studied quite a lot um, in our own project some of the specific benefits that people had experienced um, from, from living in the project. Um, and I really like to, to reflect on it in this way. How many people have heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? It's basically a kind of psychological model or theory that looks, it breaks uh, human needs down into five different levels, if you like. So the bottom level, physiological needs, they, they basically if you don't have these, you're going to die. So they're the most basic needs. And as you go up the triangle, you go to um, different levels where, I guess, increasing levels of well-being and fulfillment will result if you can get to these levels. So if I were to think about conventional housing in this country, um, one would hope it would meet the, the bottom level, and I'd, ideally it would meet the second level of safety, although, of course, I mean, depends on your landlord, depends on your neighbourhood, so we can't always guarantee our homes will be safe. But once we start looking at love and belonging, I mean, these are the things that, that there needs to be that extra oomph to really create this within a community. And these are the kind of things that we create... And self-esteem and confidence and respect of others and, and problem solving, these are things that are created when people collaborate together to commission and to build their own homes and to do it collectively is that added kind of benefit that really um, help, supports people to, leave, to live fulfilling lives. Um, I wanted to just share a couple of quotes from um, people that, that we've interviewed from different projects because I think they're really powerful to hear people's personal perspective. People come here for all kinds of reasons, for the low cost, for the ambience, but the reason they stay is for the community. The whole atmosphere of our suburb is like a big village. We all know each other. Now, you might well have that in the villages here, but how about in a big city? It's that ability to create a space to design, to build, to have something that is the manifestation of a dream. And that was someone who built a tiny home herself. The sense of community, the sense of ownership, and the pride of being able to say, we're self-governing, 
We've done this. We're not taking from the taxpayers. For me, that's an awesome feeling. And there's just a few snippets, but I think it's, it's really powerful to reflect on... Um, it's more than just housing. This is more than just a box ticking exercise. I know we all know that and we're here and we've, we've heard from different examples. But these are the kind of things I think that are important in the housing projects that we are creating now and that we need to create in the future to create the society that not only tackles climate change but it's resilient to the many challenges we're going to see in the coming decades. Stability, reduce financial pressures, lower rent, having to work less, being able to contribute more to your community and to your family. Connection, diversity, learning new skills. And then all of those things feed into these personal benefits of self-determination, being able to make your own decisions, belonging, sense of pride and self-worth. So I wanted to just finish by, by talking about um, uh, some projects that we're involved in um, back in, down in Bristol um, to show you some examples of how we're actually putting this kind of theory into practice. So I mentioned self-finish earlier on, and this is a scheme that uh, we as Ecomotive have been supporting Bristol Community Land Trust in doing, which is they've, they've um, designed and, and built or renovated um, 12 homes, mixture of um, shared ownership and affordable rent. Um, and our role was to train and support the people who were coming into that scheme to collaborate together and to finish their own home. And it was fairly minimal jobs, so they had to fit their own kitchens, they had to lay their flooring, painting and decorating and the tiling. Um, but to do that, they had to learn some skills, and actually many of them had never picked up a power tool before. So, um, and they also had to learn to collaborate together, and they had lots of meetings, and the role was facilitating that group. And in doing that, they all worked on each other's houses um, and, um, over a few months, and it was a very powerful experience. Um, and actually, this, this woman here, Jennifer, says, sums it up by saying, I've enjoyed using my practical skills learning many new ones and working alongside my new neighbours. I hope more people will have this opportunity to be so closely involved in finishing their own homes. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're really keen to promote, is even if you're doing a community land trust project, for example, um, why not consider allowing the people to have some kind of role in finishing off their homes? And it can be quite light touch, but even if you're renting your own home, if you've had that experience of doing some of the finishing touches on it and collaborating with your neighbours. You've already built the community before you move in. And that's really powerful. Um, this is a, now a, a live project that we're um, uh, working on with um, Bridge Farm, with Ashley Vale Action Group. And this is the community group that originally developed the, the houses where I live in Ashley Vale. They then went on to do a second scheme, which they're now developing. It's a three and a half acre farm, fairly close into Bristol. Um, and we've really kind of up the game in terms of, of the aspiration to create something that is really exemplar in terms of the environment, in terms of social, in terms of um, financial and long-term affordability. And it's a very collaborative exercise. There have been lots of focus groups and anyone from the local area is invited in to come and contribute to creating that strategy. That's a really exciting project and you can, you can follow it online. Um, and then what the... The, 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 the other thing that we did was to, um, we wanted to f work out, people approached us and said, oh, I really want to self-build my home, but I don't have the time, I don't have a big budget, what can you do to help? Um, and so we asked people, and we went, went to lots of events, and we asked people to write down, what is it, what's your dream, or what is it that you need? And so and people, of course, have got all different priorities. So, for example, like a home that's future-proof for as you, as you age, to meet your health needs. Some people only just want a small home. Someone just wants to get their hands dirty and get on with building a green home, a creative home, and thinking differently. And so um, what we came up with was um, this, this idea, which was for a modular home. And this kind of off-site manufacture is becoming increasingly popular. Um, we really wanted to take the idea of living in a small modular home. Um, and we've heard about home, having a home that's a box and that being the most efficient in terms of cost and kind of keeping the heat in. Um, so this is a modular home, but with the potential for the owner to choose to spec it out in the way they would like with the windows and the doors, the cladding, but also to do some of that work themselves and be supported to do that. So we're really excited. We're going to be, um, we're just setting up a pop-up build space to build our prototype in Bristol. Um, and again, you can, you can follow all of this. Um, and I'll, oh dear, this isn't very legible with the color, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, ecomotive.org is our website. Um, 
Andy, you're going to be sending out copies of slides or anything? Well, I think we will be, won't we, uh, Kevin? Is that well, <laughs> well, visit our website, visit our website, ecomotive.org, which is easy. There's links on there to some films, which I think you can see on our website. And these are little inspiring clips, basically, of different projects and things I've talked about. So go off and do that. Get inspired. Go for it and build your dream. Thank you.